Hello everybody, and welcome to my comprehensive Don't Starve Survival Guide. Today I'll be teaching you how to survive an entire year in the Reign of Giants DLC of Don't Starve. Fans of the channel may know that I already released each season separately. This is true, but don't click away. Even if you've already watched all four of those videos, I'm not just lazily slapping them together and uploading them. At the end of this full year survival guide, I have a brand new segment. And while yes, you could just skip to that part of the video, it really does help my channel out if you watch the entire video. So uh, yeah, that would be really appreciated. This video is of course going to be pretty long. We are going to cover every single day of the Don't Starve year and how to efficiently survive each and every season. The Don't Starve year is comprised of 73 days and is segmented into four different seasons, autumn, winter, spring, and summer. And after watching this video, you should safely be able to maximize your efficiency and survival skills in each season. With all that said, however, let's get into this epic survival guide. Our first survival tip actually starts in the main menu. You see, when you start a new game, you get a 50% chance to spawn in either spring or autumn. Go ahead and switch that to just autumn. All this is doing is taking the RNG out of your spawn, and an autumn spawn is infinitely easier than a spring spawn, especially for someone completely new to the game. Of course, leave all of the other settings untouched to get the base, and in my opinion, best, experience. Now, before we start, let's look at exactly what autumn in this game means, and what things you'll be able to do in this season. Let's start with the list of active effects. Autumn has fair temperatures, meaning no real risk of overheating or freezing. Red hounds can spawn during hound attacks. There will be more info on hound attacks later, but red hounds cause fire when they die. You also won't likely need to worry about this during your first autumn, but it will become a hazard in subsequent autumns. All food will spoil at a normal rate. Rain is infrequent, but can occur. The seasonal boss of Autumn is Berger, who is actually very easy to deal with and can help you farm trees in mass. You won't have to worry about Berger until your second Autumn. Now, let's get into the fun facts that don't really affect gameplay too much. The screen will have a cool red tint to it, and birch nut trees have colorful leaves. Fully grown ones will also drop an extra birch nut. With Autumn now fully explained, Let's get into your first day. Once you spawn in, you are going to want to immediately begin gathering resources. This means grass, berries, twigs, and most importantly, flint. While doing this, you may see a beautiful butterfly fluttering about. Unfortunately, those wings are a great early game food source, so you're going to want to punch it. I know it sounds evil, but you gotta eat. Do this to every butterfly you see to give you a nice snack, while saving the berries for an emergency because they are much better cooked. Now, with some of those twigs and flint that you picked up, go ahead and make a pickaxe and an axe. Using the pickaxe, break some boulders for some extra stones and flint. And using the axe, find the largest tree you can and cut it down. While breaking boulders, pay close attention to boulders with gold streaks in them. This will give you gold, a vital resource. Keep repeating this until your tools break. You may come across a wormhole during your travels. These are completely safe to jump into and act as a teleporter that costs sanity. If you would like, you can jump in it, however I chose not to to save on sanity. At this point, if you find more gold, feel free to build a second pickaxe and get to mining. Unfortunately, all of this work you have done has come at a cost. Time. And night in this game is not as simple as a game like Minecraft or Ark. No, night is an enemy in itself in this game. You need a light source or you will succumb to Charlie, aka the night monster. How will we do this? Some of you may think you should just plop down a campfire and wait until daytime. You do not want to do this. Time in this game is your biggest enemy. You only have 21 days, or in real life time, 2.8 hours, since each in-game day is 8 minutes, until winter. So you must spend as much of that time as possible being productive to ensure your survival. To do this, we craft ourselves a torch and go on our way, exploring throughout the night. 
A pro tip that can help your torch last longer is juggling it, or swapping off the torch and back on just before Charlie attacks you. Charlie is kind enough to give you an audible warning before attacking, so if you listen for this noise, then you can safely juggle your torch. This comes at a cost of sanity, however, so it may be better to just craft another torch. Day 2 is for progress. With all of the resources that you got yesterday, go ahead and make a science machine. Then with the science machine, you're going to make a few vital tools. A backpack, four cut stone, two electrical doodads, and four boards. If you don't have enough resources, then quickly go and grab some before continuing. Then with all of these resources, you're going to want to make an alchemy engine, but do not place it down. Make yourself some rope as well, and then use that rope to make your first weapon, a spear. Then after you've done that, feel free to use a hammer and break that science machine down for an easy refund. Now, dedicate the rest of this day to collecting resources and exploring. We are looking for a very specific spot to place our base down, the Pig Village. This is because the Pig King will provide a very easy source of gold, and the pigmen can be a great source of pigskin and meat. Make sure to keep moving through the night by torchlight. Pro tip, when you come across a brick road that looks like this, you are almost guaranteed to find the Pig King Village on either end, so follow it. If you were like me and found the Pig King Village, great! If not, then spend the day looking for it while gathering more resources. Make sure that you keep your hunger in check with those butterfly wings, and keep those berries for emergencies. Wilson can survive a little starvation. What we are going to look for now is a wormhole. You are pretty much guaranteed to have a wormhole spawn near the Pig King Village, so spend today searching for it. And as a bonus, if your search takes you into the evening, make sure to pick these green mushrooms. When cooked, they make an amazing sanity booster. Just make sure you don't eat them raw, because then they will have the opposite effect. You may find it before me, but I got unlucky with finding this wormhole, so my search took me through the night. Hopefully by now you have found the wormhole closest to the Pig King. Living near a wormhole comes with many benefits, such as escaping a dangerous hound attack, escaping giants, or simply fast traveling. In our case, this wormhole is perfectly situated where we want our winter base to be near a plains biome, and a Mactusk igloo spot. Going back to the pig village side of the wormhole now, you should begin constructing your base. Plop down a permanent campfire, it's permanent because there's stones around it, that's how you can tell if you didn't know, and place down that alchemy engine you crafted back on day two. You can also cook and eat those berries at this point if you would like to. Our next step, however, is spider killing, because we need monster meat. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to super easily and safely dispose of spiders and even their nest if you want to. Where do you find these spider nests? The best places to look are forest biomes and swamp biomes. However, forests are much safer since you won't need to worry about a stray tentacle whapping you around. Go ahead and make yourself a few traps. One or two will work, but three is the best in case you run into a max level spider nest or three small ones close together. When you get to the spider nest, drop the traps and then aggro the spiders. If you can get the spiders to walk into the traps, then you will net a free spider kill. Continue to do this until you get four monster meat. As a side note, when no spiders are spawning anymore, the nest is empty. And then you can safely break it. However, I would advise waiting until the nest is a tier 3 nest, signified by three lumps of silk on it, before breaking it, since that will allow you to replant it wherever you want. We will then use the four monster meat you got to segue into the most important combat tip you can learn in this game. This game has a pretty simple combat system. You want to hit things, but also not get hit yourself. The best way to do this is kiting, which is hitting an enemy a certain amount of times, baiting out and dodging a hit, and then repeating the cycle until the mob is dead. We're going to use this information to kill a were pig. Now, werepigs hit very hard and are more than capable of killing you. But, after watching this video, you should be more than confident to take one down without taking a single hit. How do we summon a werepig? Head over to the pig village and feed a pigman for monster meat. 
Once he begins transforming, you can use this to get one free hit in, run away while waiting out a hit, hit two times, run away, and simply rinse and repeat until the pig is dead. Almost every mob in this game can be handled with kiting. If you're not sure how many hits you can get in before they hit back, just stick with one. Most mobs you can get away with two hits, and sometimes three. There are some notable exceptions that can't be kited or are hard to kite, including Krampus and Dragonfly. But they have their own strategies which I will go over later. Now that you are one pigskin richer, head back to your base and craft up some rope with your hard earned grass. Then using one rope and one pigskin, make yourself a football helmet. Boom. You now have one of the best pieces of armor in the entire game. This helmet will save you if you mess up while kiting mobs, or if you need to tank them since they are unkiteable. Craft yourself a torch because now it's time to gather some charcoal to make sure we can keep ourselves fed. Now you may be thinking, why would we need charcoal to keep ourselves fed? Don't worry, we aren't just going to start gnawing on burnt trees. This charcoal will become very, very useful in creating an essential cooking item. Using your torch, find some isolated woods to burn down. Ensure that there are no non-renewable items such as saplings or grass blades in the path of the fire either. If there is, then make sure to use a shovel to pick it up before burning the trees down. Doing this should lead you into... Now that you have some burnt trees, cut them down to get some charcoal. I would recommend repeating this until you have a sizable amount of charcoal, as it will come in handy during winter. You may also notice you have some stubble if you are playing as Wilson. This is part of his beard growing mechanic, and you will want to keep this because it will help you immensely when temperatures start to drop. Once you have at least 10 pieces of charcoal or more, come back to your base and go ahead and build three cut stone, then build a crock pot. This structure is going to be your backbone throughout your entire playthrough. It can turn inedible items into very filling items. Another thing you can build to help with inventory management is a chest. It requires three boards and has nine inventory slots. Or if you live in a place free from mole worms, you can safely just leave things on the ground. Now grab a torch and head back out because it's adventuring time. Our next goal is to find a knight, bishop, or rook. These mechanical beasts drop the precious gears that we need to create an icebox, which will keep our food fresh for much, much longer. By day 6 you should have hopefully found some sort of set piece. If not, then keep searching. The knight's kiting pattern is pretty simple. Two hits, run, two hits, repeat until dead. Then take those sweet gears and make your way back home. Once home, craft up one cut stone and make yourself an ice box. Now you have a reliable storage for your food. Now about food. You may be getting a little hungry. How do we fix this? Using one meaty item, it can be any meat, small, big, or even monster meat, and three filler items, which can be mushrooms, berries, or even ice if you have it, you will make meatballs. The best and most cost-effective food item in this entire game. Once you've cooked some up, Feast like the king you are, because we still have work to do. What work is there to do? Well, exploring, of course. If you have not found a Mactus campsite by now, then now will be the time to do so. If you have, like me, then use this time to find some important biomes, like the desert, which provides infinite resources with the rolling tumbleweeds. Make sure you remember to always stay mobile even throughout the night. Winter is growing ever closer, and you will need to be prepared if you want to survive it. Today you may or may not get a hound attack. Now, hound attacks are signaled by a warning sound that sounds like this. And when you hear that, you have a little time to prepare. Your first hound attack should be easy to do by yourself. Using kiting, you can safely get two hits and then three hits to kill the hound. Do this quick enough and you should get through the hound attack with ease. Do note, however, that hound attacks get increasingly difficult with special elemental hounds joining in later, and an overwhelming amount of hounds with them. Once you get that far in though, you should be able to set up a hound tooth trap area to quickly and safely dispatch them. Other than that, dedicate the entirety of this day to exploring and resource gathering. Again, if you have not found a MACTUS camp, then keep searching. 
I personally spent this day wrangling spiders for some extra monster meat and silk. I would advise you to do the same if you have time, because we are going to use this monster meat to convert some pigs and the silk will come in handy during winter. Day 8 will start with you potentially exploring. Your goal is to have found the MAC test camp by tonight. Or if you have already, and you followed me in gathering monster meat, then go ahead and farm some pigs. Remember the two hit rule and you should get through it with no damage at all. You may also notice that your sanity is getting pretty low at this time, if you haven't been picking flowers or eating cooked green mushrooms. While this seems scary, you are completely safe as long as you stay above 15% sanity. You can tell that you are above 15% because when you are under 15%, then red tendrils will creep onto your screen. At that point, you will need to fight your own demons. Literally. You most likely need some more gold by now, and if you aren't afraid of facing your own demons, then a very simple and effective source of gold is grave robbing. Sometimes when digging up graves, you will receive a strange item. In my case, it was frazzled wires and a desiccated tentacle. As you can see, however, it came at a cost. I am now insane. Dealing with shadow creatures is actually pretty simple. Hit them once, let them teleport, let them try to hit you, and then hit them again, as shown on screen now. Something to also keep in mind is that there are two types of shadow creatures. The slow and not so scary crawling horror, and the fast and devastating terror beak. Both use the same kiting rule, however the terror beak is much, much faster than the crawling horror. This of course becomes more complicated when you get attacked by more than one shadow creature, but it's simple if you can get the flow of attacks down like I have here. Defeating a shadow creature is rewarding. Not only will you gain a little bit of sanity back, but you will also be rewarded with some nightmare fuel, a very important late game item. You may also come across a tall bird nest in the rockier regions of this realm. You can easily kill the tall birds with a two hit kiting pattern, the same way as the were pigs from before. This will net you two large pieces of meat and an egg that is a great emergency food since uncooked it will never spoil. Day 9 is also a special day, your first full moon night. Now you may have noticed a certain statue around the Pig King village. This statue spawns a critter named Glomer, who is not only cute, but he gives you a huge sanity buff if you stay around him. Unfortunately, we have to kill Glomer. It's sad, but we need to make a very specific item from the now deceased Glomer using the wilted flower and Glomer's wings. The old bell. Be aware that killing Glomer will spawn a Krampus, who you should be able to just tank with your football helmet and a spear. When you get back to the Pig King village, you'll learn that the Pig King is a bit of a weirdo. Those strange items that you dug up can be traded to him for heaps of gold. Just don't ask what he needs that desiccated tentacle for. <laughs> To make an old bell, you will need to use a pickaxe to break Glomer's statue. Don't worry, this still allows Glomer to respawn every new full moon. Using the old bell, find yourself some trees, or in my case, a spider nest surrounded by trees. Ring the bell, and run like hell. This will summon a large foot to stomp on everything in a straight line, knocking down trees and demolishing buildings. It's also capable of one-hitting the player, so you really don't want to get squished by this thing. Don't worry about collecting all the wood, we will be back for it later, it's not going anywhere. Spend the rest of the night exploring. Remember everything that you must find before winter if you have not. If sanity is becoming a real concern for you like it is for me, don't forget that cooked green caps can make a huge difference. Another sanity management tip is to wear a flower garland from any extra petals you have. It doesn't do much, but it does help a little. You will want to spend the rest of today exploring, and checking out every notable thing you can possibly find. Also, if you haven't used the rest of your old bell, go ahead and use it on some very forested areas and enjoy the destruction. Somewhere on your adventuring journeys, you should come across a suspicious looking eye bone. You want to pick this up as it will summon Chester, 
a mobile chest that follows you and basically will be your best buddy for the entirety of your playthrough. With Chester hopefully by your side, make your way home while collecting as many resources as you can. You hopefully now have most of your stats under control. Hunger is fixed by making meatballs. Sanity is fixed by picking flowers or eating cooked green caps. And health is fixed by spider glands, or simply not getting hit. Now it's time for us to really start preparing for winter. You see, winter is going to start on day 21, and we want to be as ready as possible not to only survive winter, but actually make it as profitable as possible. Now, with Chester, again hopefully, by your side, head back to the force that you rudely deforested, and collect as many logs as you and Chester can hold. This will be what you do for a majority of day 13. Day 14 is going to be dedicated to silk, monster meat, and charcoal. I would advise getting silk in the brighter hours of the day since spiders are easier to lure into traps. Using the monster meat, farm up your local pigmen. We're going for lots of pigskin because we will need it come winter. And then finally in the evening, burn down your local forest to create some charcoal. Again, be careful to only burn trees and not non-renewable resources. Today your job will be grass and twigs. No, seriously. Winter will cause you to become almost glued to your base thanks to how freezing works. So we want to ensure we have enough of the basic materials to not have to worry about making a potentially deadly trip out into the cold. As a side note, now you should be looking into getting three jet black feathers from killing crows, two red feathers from killing red birds, and two tentacle spots from killing tentacles in the swamp to make a feather hat. I forgot to do that during this run, but it will help you create even more profit during winter. You can craft a boomerang from one board, one charcoal, and one silk to kill the crows and redbirds. And as for the tentacles, your best bet will be to lure some spiders or merms over to deal with it since they can be incredibly hard to kite. Another winter essential is a thermal stone, which uses one regular pickaxe and some stones to craft. This will keep your temperature close to whatever the stone's temperature is. However, if you're playing as Wilson, your beard should provide plenty of insulation. Same deal for day 16. Harvest as much grass and twigs as you can hold. Now that you are home from your two day long gathering spree, you should have all of your raw materials ready to do some crafting. First, make another ice box, but do not put it down yet. And then finally, using all of your extra logs, make as many boards as you can. I like to go until I just have a stack of 20 left. Make about 10 rope, and then do the same thing as with the ice box with a tent, which takes silk, rope, and twigs. Also, don't forget to make a crock pot. Now, with your new stuff, head over to that Magtus camp, which you hopefully found, and build a permanent campfire in the closest plains biome. Try to make sure it's not too close to the Magtus camp. Mine certainly was far too close. If you haven't found a Magtus camp, then any plains biome will do. However, it must be a plains biome. You could tell by the brighter grass that it is a plains biome. Then finally place down the rest of your structures near, but not too close to the fire. Trust me on this, you will thank me later, especially if you play on a controller like I do. Winter is rapidly approaching and unfortunately we haven't had many good ways to control our sanity. Luckily today we're going to take care of that. Using your football helmet, head over to that desert that you hopefully found, pick a few cacti, and then we can roast these on a fire to make a very potent sanity cure. For me, day 19 was very rainy. This plus the cold weather meant some early freezing happened. If it starts raining in your world, do not panic. You shouldn't be able to freeze. Your sanity will just not be too great. Spend the rest of the day preparing and moving over your essentials to your new winter home. This includes your silk, charcoal, and boards. 
It's day 20. The final day before autumn ends, and the day I finally explain what you were setting all this up to do. You see, during winter you can't do much. The temps make sure you know that. So what will we do to make the most of our time? Krampus farming. The Krampus farming in question will be by using a boomerang to kill as many bluebirds as possible, to spawn as many Krampi as possible. Why do we want to do this? Because you're going to want a sack. His, <laughs> his sack is an upgraded backpack that's both waterproof and fireproof. Don't be surprised if you don't get it at all even after a whole season of farming. This thing is unbelievably rare. But it's better to try. Other than that, what should you do today? Final preparations, of course. Today is your last day to get the feather hat because redbirds do not spawn during winter. And I really suggest you try to get it since it will increase the amount of birds that will spawn, thus increasing potential cramp by kills throughout the winter. Didn't bring a lot of food over? No problem. Birds drop morsels. Put four of these into a crock pot and boom! Half of your hunger is filled. And trust me, you're going to be doing a lot of bird killing, so by the end of this you'll probably have an icebox full of morsels. And you won't even know what to do with it. Now first, let's go over what exactly winter is and what effects it has on the climate and your character. We'll start with the gameplay affecting changes. Now, because this season is supposed to be significant, this list is pretty long. Temperatures are significantly lower than normal. This can cause freezing if the character is left without a heat source for extended periods of time. This temperature also fluctuates throughout the season, becoming significantly worse during the solstice and milder for the first and last few days. Rain is replaced by snow. Now originally I was going to add this to the cosmetics or unsubstantial effects category, but snow covers the ground and blocks your ability to see things like roads, which can affect gameplay massively. Snow is very frequent, especially closer to the solstice. Snow also lowers your temperature, but the effect is so mild compared to the already sub-zero temps that it's not very noticeable. Blue hounds can spawn. Unlike last season, you most likely will have to deal with these guys. Blue hounds freeze nearby creatures after they die, but the player has to kill two blue hounds in quick succession to actually be frozen. Mac Tusk hunting camps are active. That small circle you hopefully found in the last season will now be replaced by an igloo that spawns Mac Tusk and his son Wee Tusk and two blue hounds. Plants no longer grow, but fully grown plants can't ungrow, meaning if you have crops or grass or even twigs that are fully grown before winter starts, they can still be harvested, but they won't grow back until spring. Mini glaciers will become full size during this season. If you ran into any puddles of water last season, then now will be the time to harvest them since ice is an amazing filler crockpot item. Pengols, which are essentially penguin seagulls, can sprout out of the ocean while you are walking by. This is a great source of ice as they spawn icebergs when they pop out. Nights become significantly longer. I'm sure this is pretty self-explanatory. It's winter after all. Many animals become inactive. Bees, butterflies, mosquitoes, and frogs, namely. Food spoils 25% slower due to lower temperatures. Ice will never melt even in your inventory during winter. The seasonal boss is Deerclops, a mighty foe that has a relatively easy kiting pattern. Deerclops is not guaranteed to spawn, but it is most likely that he will, meaning you should prepare for this battle. With that unbelievably long list done, let's go over cosmetic changes. These have very little or no gameplay effects. Redbirds no longer show up and are replaced by snowbirds. Bunnies get a white coat. Koalaphants become their winter variety and drop a special trunk. But honestly, you can go through the entire game without hunting these guys, since there's much better sources of food. Now that we've finally finished that extensive list, let's get into the gameplay. It is now day 21, the beginning of winter and the end of autumn. Now because my camp was too close to the Mactus camping site, 
I was immediately thrown into combat with him and his hounds. This is not a hard battle, simply focus down the big cheese Mactus himself and then dispatch his dogs. You can leave his son alive if you would like, since I don't believe he drops anything notable. This actually is sort of a conundrum. Do you kill his son so he doesn't have to bear the weight of seeing his father and two dogs slaughtered in front of him? Or do you leave him alive in hopes that he can live with this? Shortly after this bout of self-reflection, you will probably remember that it's just a game. And much like your Minecraft wolf that you left rotting in that starter house you made during your two-week Minecraft craze five years ago, Wee Tusk is simply just a bit of code. Who won't care regardless of the outcome? If you were smart and chose not to live as close to the Mactus camp as me, then you will still want to fight him today, because he has two drops that we are aiming to get. The most important of the two being a Walrus Tusk, which we so happen to get, and a Tama Shanter, which we actually will end up getting later. Again, the fight won't be difficult. Even with just your football helmet, you can tank all three of them. Just make sure to focus Mr. Tusk down, because if he gets far enough away, he will shoot at you with a blow dart. And that complicates things. Once you have hopefully obtained the Walrus Tusk, heat your Thermal Stone up near your fire, and then make your way back up to your base. With some gold, twigs, and the aforementioned Walrus Tusk, you can make the Walking Cane, a powerful item that will allow you to move significantly faster while it's equipped. Can't find the Walking Cane blueprint? That's because for some reason Clay decided it would be a great idea to put this item in the dress tab. I cannot tell you how much time this wasted in my first playthrough. Man, it's... I, dress tab? Why? Now after this I foolishly left the winter camp, because I thought that I could quickly make the feather hat. Unfortunately, I clearly forgot to watch the great How to Survive Autumn video from the super famous Polar Lotus. Because if I had, then I would have known that ship has sailed. You, however, most likely did, or at least I hope so. So using your feather hat, today you are going to start your long and hopefully lucky journey of Krampus farming. Due to the Mac Tusk encounter and the crafting you probably did, you won't have time to get a Krampus spawn tonight, but you can at least get started. Don't know how to Krampus farm? Just build a boomerang, kill some birds, and the rest is history. I'll go over it a little more in detail here shortly. If you happen to stay near the ocean for a while, pangles will spawn. As previously stated, these guys aren't very useful on their own and will actually become a nuisance by eating all of your dropped food. However, when they spawn, four icebergs will spawn with them, leading to some easy ice, which will come in handy for cooling yourself down in the summer months or as a good emergency filler for meatballs. Since in an ice box, they will never melt. Day 22 is here and congratulations! You survived your very first day of winter. Unfortunately, things just get colder and frankly more boring from here on out. I had a hound attack today. You may too, but the days they attack are random, so you may also not. Now, day 22 meant significantly more hounds than normal. The way I dealt with these hounds was convenient killer beehives. Regular bees may not be active in the winter months, but their killer cousins sure are. Just be sure not to get stung yourself. They can very quickly degrade your football helmet. Another option if you don't have killer bees near you is pengals, beefalo, or even pigs. After that, spend the rest of the night Krampus farming. Now that this will be life for the next 15 days, I may as well go over the science of this particular farming method. Krampus spawns on a naughtiness scale. As you kill innocent mobs like birds, butterflies, glomer, or rabbits, your naughtiness will go up. Gain enough naughtiness, and Krampus will spawn. This is based on a point system as well. So if you count your bird kills, it should be 25 bird kills for each Krampus spawn, since each bird gives two naughtiness points, and you need 50 for a spawn. This is also why we wanted a plains biome. Snowbirds give two naughtiness, and crows only give one. Krampus is actually a pretty significant opponent, able to deal some massive damage and being incredibly hard if not impossible to kite. Sounds bad already? Well, it gets worse. He will also pick up items on the ground and destroy chests, 
And if you don't kill him fast enough, he will vanish into his sack and you will never see those beloved items again. So how do we deal with this? Lay out some bait items. I did traps, but it can be any item you are not afraid of losing. And then while Krampus is beelining for your bait, spam him with your spear. He hits hard, but you should only take one or two hits before downing him. And your football helmet should keep you safe. This is also what we needed all of that pigskin for. I went through about three helmets this winter with Mac Tusk and Krampus battles combined, so you may need more or less depending on how many battles you take. Never let your football helmet get too low either. Once it hits 10%, swap it out for a fresh new one. The junk football helmet can be used for cactus harvesting or any other damaging but controllable activity. Today you're going to want to continue Krampus farming. By now you should have lots of morsels saved up. Combine four of these into a crock pot to make meatballs. And now you have your winter food source taken care of. As a side note, if you have any other filler items, you can also just put one morsel and then three filler items. That'll also make meatballs too. Today I had Mac Tusk respawn. However, this didn't seem right based on his respawn interval. So I'm actually unsure if he will respawn today for you too. It's worth a check though. Aren't I just the best at giving thoughtful tutorials? <laughs> Other than that, again, keep Krampus farming. It's going to become monotonous and maybe rather boring, but I promise you this is the absolute best time to do it. And that man's sack is worth it. You also may notice that tent we built last autumn has been suspiciously unused. Go ahead and use it to skip the night. Not only will this refill sanity, but birds do not spawn during night anyway. So you have less time sitting idle around a fire and more time whacking away at Krampus. Another Krampus farming day. You're going to get tired of this by now, so let me give you some motivation to keep going. All of this time I have been praising this man's sack, but I haven't gone into detail on why it's so good. Today, I'll explain that. Krampus's sack has a whopping 14 inventory slots. That's right, 14. That makes the backpack's measly 8 slots look pathetic. And that's not all it offers. Krampus's sack is waterproof, which means during rainstorms it can't become waterlogged and drain sanity. There will be more about rain and sanity issues in the spring segment. And it's also fireproof, so any items you put in it are safe for pretty much ever. Of course, you don't just get amazing items like this easily. It has a meager 1%. That's right, 1% chance to spawn upon killing Krampus. That is why, even though we are dedicating an entire season to actually farming it, there is a very real and depressing chance that we won't get it. However, even if we don't get it, these morsels will keep us chugging through winter, so keep on boomeranging those birds. Wake up, eat breakfast, and farm up your favorite red guy. Don't worry though, because that's not all we will be doing today. Today we are going to catch up with the man er, bug thing that made this all possible. Tonight, you will have a full moon. This means our buddy Glomer will respawn. Now you can either use this to get another Krampus kill and another old bell, but that's completely optional at this point. So you get to decide Glomer's fate, my loyal viewer. And I chose life. For now. Wake up, eat breakfast, and get to bird murdering. Isn't winter just the best season? Today should allow you to have uninterrupted Krampus farming, so focus on that. And if you happen to get his sack, great. If not, then don't worry, because my luck is not so great either. Wake up, eat breakfast, and get assaulted by Mac Tusk and his son. Or if you live farther away, then do the assaulting. This time I managed to get the Tam o Shanter, a very powerful headpiece that not only keeps you very warm, but also restores an insane amount of sanity. Don't let this distract you from your true calling, however. Krampus farming. It's day 29, and I think you know what I'm going to say by now. Continue farming Krampy Puss. 
That was a weird way to say his name. Future me, edit that out, please. Now, believe it or not, winter is actually coming close to an end. You have just six days left. You may have also noticed that my tent broke this morning. Tents have limited uses, but they are not that expensive, so you could simply craft up a new one. Stay wary though, because any day now you could hear a low grumbling noise. If you do, do not panic. You have a bit of time to prepare. This is Deerclops, and believe it or not, him spawning will make spring infinitely easier. Unfortunately for me, Deerclops never came. An unfortunate reality is that all seasonal giants only have a chance to spawn each season. This percentage is relatively large, with some sources saying 67%, but it is a dice roll. I will, however, walk you step by step how to fight Deerclops while taking little to no damage at all. Now, when you get your first warning, which has a unique sound that your character will comment on, unless you are playing as Wes or Wilbur, Build yourself a temporary campfire, but do not place it down. Temporary campfires are the kind that do not have stones around them. Then, book it out of your winter base as far as possible. And I mean far. You may think you were far enough, but I promise you, you are not. Utilize a random wormhole if you have to. After the third warning, Deerclops will begin his hunt. This generally starts conveniently when night begins. If this is the case for you, don't panic because that's what the campfire is for. Plop it down and prepare to kite the beast. That's right, you're going to take this beast down mano e mano. Some people will tell you to put it to sleep and use expensive tactics such as gunpowder or, or blow darts. But I promise you this fight is actually not bad. And the worst part is the guaranteed insanity, which also is easy to fight off. I find that the best kiting pattern is two hits, beta hit out, then two hits, but occasionally you can get away with three hits. Once you get the rhythm down, it's literally just a rinse and repeat until dead. The fight will become harder as it goes on since your sanity will plummet, and shadow creatures will join in. But again, if you can get the flow of this fight down, then it's still relatively easy. While I do not have the footage of me fighting Deerclops here, Check out my 100 days Reign of Giants playthrough to see me conquering this beast in the exact way I'm describing now. The video is up in the top right, but if you would like to finish this video first, then that's totally cool too. After that epic battle, the sanity loss from the battle can be quickly offset by a good night's sleep or cooked green caps. Wake up, eat breakfast, Farm Krampus, also keep an ear out for Deerclops. Wake up, eat breakfast, farm Krampus, and of course, watch out for the Deerclops. Also, I guess I will use this time to explain a vital Krampus spawning mechanic. Once you hit your next winter, if you decide to do this again, up to four Krampi can spawn at once. That's right, so this farm gets much more effective with age. However, I guess you could say it also becomes more deadly with age. Wake up, eat breakfast, and assault Mr. Tusk. Try your hardest to get 9 blue gems from these hounds, too. It will come in handy during summer. And then of course, you know what to do for the rest of the day. Wake up, eat breakfast, and farm Krampus. If you are feeling bored of this cycle, don't worry, spring is almost here. Wake up, eat breakfast, and farm Krampus. I actually ran out of supplies to farm him today, so I spent the day gathering silk and wood. If you need to do the same at all during this farming run, feel free to do it. Krampus is not a missable mob, and you really don't need to feel rushed to farm him as efficiently as possible. I mean, honestly, if you wanted to take a break from farming and have enough morsels, you could technically skip through winter using your tent, ignoring Krampus as much as possible. He won't really be going anywhere, and you can use this farm during any season. The final day of winter is here. Enjoy it by... 
Krampus farming. Or, if it's downpouring in your world like it is for me, enjoy it by seeking shelter and waiting until dusk to take your final winter nap of the year. Now, spring is considered a milder season. However, it still has some harsh effects that rank it below autumn in terms of easiness. Let's go over the effects spring has on the environment and the effects it has on your character. Temperatures are back to normal. However, due to excess rain, you may suffer from freezing for the first few days. Flash rainstorms are incredibly common. This has a multitude of effects, namely the character will become wet if they are exposed for too long, soaking their equipment and draining sanity. And it has the potential to cause lightning strikes. While getting struck by lightning in this game does shockingly little damage, it can start fires which can lead to base destruction. Rain also causes fires and fire-based lighting, like torches, to go out much faster. There is two good things rain brings, however, and that is plants will grow much faster when it is raining and mushrooms respawn during the rain. Animal tempers will change. Namely, beefalo will enter heat, meaning they will attack anyone nearby for reasons, and bees become aggressive. Rabbit dens become flooded, meaning no rabbits will spawn for the duration of the season. Dusk becomes longer, which can lead to sanity issues. Food spoils at a normal rate. However, wet food spoils at an incredibly accelerated rate, so avoid leaving food on the ground or getting soaked while holding food. For some reason, enemies gain a memory buff during this season as they will chase you much farther and see you from farther away. Not sure why, it just is. Trees grow much faster. Lure plants will randomly pop up. These can be a nuisance as they steal and digest your stuff, but when utilized, they can make a very powerful automatic harvesting farm. Flowers will randomly bloom around the player. This can lead to large patches of flowers spawning, which can spawn butterflies which in my opinion are the best food source in the game early to mid-game. Blue Hounds will spawn. If you didn't have to deal with them last winter, then you are guaranteed to deal with at least one now. But Blue Hounds are actually the weaker of the two elemental hounds, so you'll be okay. Last but not least, the seasonal boss is Moose Goose, a strange hybrid being that's going through a severe identity crisis. This is actually the easiest boss in the game to deal with since you actually don't have to deal with her. There will be more about her in her dedicated segment. With that list done, let's move into cosmetic effects that don't affect gameplay or have very little effect. Puddles will form on the ground, leading to squishy feet noises. Is that the right way to say that? Wait, should I redo that part? The screen will have a pastel green tint. With all of that done, let's finally jump back into the gameplay and what you should do to face this surprisingly difficult season. If you followed along with the last video, then your inventory may be a mess. Today is a pretty simple day, recouping and cleaning your inventory. Azul feathers are actually not that useful, so don't be afraid to leave them behind. If you were lucky and snagged a relatively easy Deerclops kill, now will be the time to make an Ibrella, one of the best headpieces in the game. This sucker will keep you dry no matter what type of rain is falling around you. It even somehow protects you from lightning. Unfortunately, I was not lucky enough to be graced with Deerclops' presence, and if you were not either, then using some pigskin, some twigs, and silk, you can make a peasant handheld umbrella. Which works about the same, however you must be wearing a football helmet or some other waterproof helmet to achieve 100% rain resistance. Ugh. Seeing as I am playing as Wilson, and you maybe are too, I shaved today. However, this was a mistake that cost me lots of time. If you were playing as Wilson, keep that beard until the equinox when temps start to rise. Now today you can begin to utilize that surplus of monster meat you got from farming Krampus last season. Hunt down and transform as many pigmen as you can. This will slowly begin filling your surplus of pig skins. Other than that, it's time to begin our journey into the magic tab and build a Prestahatitator. 
First, make sure you have four boards and a top hat, which, if you don't know, is made using silk. Then grab your shovel, build some traps, and head to the closest savanna biome. Again, avoid beefalo as much as possible since when in heat they will attack anything that goes near them. They won't be in heat for the entire season, but they will go into heat eventually. Now, we need rabbits to make a prestahatitator, but the rabbits are all gone, so is it even possible to make this device during this season? The answer is yes. You can dig up rabbit holes to force spawn the rabbit that lives there. While this technically does remove what is normally a renewable resource, rabbits are already plentiful and losing four rabbit spawners will not ruin your world, I promise. So get to digging and trapping those rabbits until you have four of them. You may also notice that today is already day three of spring, which means you might have a boss fight. That's right. Moose Goose will spawn early in spring instead of late like every other seasonal boss in the entire game. Not only does she spawn early, but she will spawn immediately after giving her first warning honk, giving you little to no time to prepare. Luckily, she is an extreme pushover and you can either kite her with a three hit pattern or hire some pigs to handle the job for you. Even a swarm of spiders will work, since Moose Goose is the only boss besides the Ancient Guardian that doesn't have an AoE attack. Be careful if you plan to fight her on your own, however. She may be the easiest boss, but that does not make her weak. She not only packs an absolute massive amount of damage in each of her hits, she also will honk after every third hit, disarming you and making you have to retrieve your weapon. Once you get the pattern down, however, it will be very simple. Unfortunately, Moose Goose's special item, the Down Feather, is not entirely useful and can be incredibly niche. Though this is true for every boss's drop, except for Deerclops, who has arguably the best two uses in the game. A literal turret and the hat which I should be wearing. You may also be wondering, why am I not showing footage of me taking the Queen of Spring down? Well, much like Deerclops, Moose Goose only has a chance to spawn and I unluckily lucked out. I'm actually not sure why I'm getting unreasonably lucky and it's kind of making me upset since there is a real lack of boss fighting in this tutorial. Oh well, let's hope we can at least finish strong with an intense dragonfly battle in the summer. Either way, we now have a prestahatitator. Next step, a shadow manipulator. For this we are going to need to acquire a few things, living logs, nightmare fuel, and a purple gem. Living logs can either be chopped down from totally normal trees, hint, they are not totally normal and have a rather spooky face, or the more fun way is to defeat a tree guard. Finally, some action. Now, I had remembered seeing a tree guard earlier that had sprung from our old bell farming tactics that we had, so let's go show how you can easily down this beast. The tree guard can be downed with a simple three hit kiting pattern. However, as you see, if you have incredibly fast reflexes, you can actually get away with four hits. But if you want to be safe, since these guys do hit like a truck, then go to the three hit method. And before you know it, you will have more than enough living logs. Now, I had a hound attack in the middle of the night, so I'm going to use this as an opportunity to teach you the best way to stay alive if you are swarmed by enemies, surrounded by darkness, and can't run away. Simply run around in circles and try not to get cut off. Spoiler alert, this won't be the only time I use this tactic during this season. I get a little battle hungry. Next up on our list is purple gems. Now normally you can make a purple gem by combining one blue and one red gem. This is basic art class stuff. However, something that art class didn't teach you is that you can also get a purple gem by defeating a bishop in battle. While this may sound funny out of context, I'm going to show you exactly how to take one of these ranged beasts down now. For this battle, you may want a log suit. I normally do not wear nor do I recommend chest armor because it takes up that precious backpack slot. However, bishops can actually cause you to get stun locked, so using some logs and some rope you can make yourself a log suit. Now, where can we find a bishop? Some set pieces can have bishops like the one that allowed us to fight the knight to get some gears. However, there is one place where all of the chess pieces are guaranteed to spawn, including two bishops, the Teleportato Platform. Once you find the Teleportato Platform, you have two options, 
rush the bishop and attempt to kill it. By doing this, you are guaranteed to take damage because the bishop is a ranged, unkiteable opponent, but you will eventually down it. Or bait the nearby rook to hit the bishop a few times, killing it while hopefully taking minimal damage. I went for a strange hybrid method that actually got me hit way more than I would like to admit. With the purple gem acquired, now you just need one more thing. Nightmare fuel. To get this, we can simply eat a raw green cap to trigger instant insanity, and then defeat a few shadow creatures. However, this is costly and can actually be dangerous since terror beaks hit relatively hard. Why don't we wait until tomorrow night to get a much better method that also gives us a lot of another vital resource. Day 41 is a full moon night. Now you may be thinking, cool, Glomer, another old bell. While that's correct, there's another hidden feature of full moons that primarily affects these touchstone platforms you've come across in your journeys. Particularly the skewered pig heads, which is actually really messed up if you think about it. I mean, clearly these pigmen show some human intelligence traits, so this is almost as bad as a human head on a stick, huh? Oh well. We don't care since we've been transforming and killing them since autumn. An arguably worse fate, as we don't know how painful the wear pigification process is. Anyways, enough banter. Upon the full moon, these pig heads will have their eyes open, and breaking them with a hammer in this state yields nightmare fuel and two pig skins. It also yields another disturbing question. Are these pig heads still alive? Are they doomed to forever have a blinking existence with their only sentience being during the full moon? Who knows? All I know is we now have more than enough nightmare fuel. Now that you're home, make that shadow manipulator and then grab your extra living logs and nightmare fuel. Because now we will make one of, if not the best weapon in the game, the dark sword. It's basically a hyper upgraded spear that does enough damage to three shot hounds with its only downside being it will induce insanity if you wield it for too long. While this seems annoying, think about how much you really need to hold a weapon in this game. Fights are not that long unless they are boss fights, so yeah, it's worth it. Now that that objective is done, it's time for you to begin your alternate objective that you may not complete, but if you do, summer will be easy mode. You see, if you manage to get your hands on nine blue gems and spread them into Chester's inventory, he will transform into Snow Chester during a full moon, which is basically a mobile icebox. Iceboxes cool down thermal stones. I think you see where I'm going with this. Today was for hunting blue gems. I spent the majority of the day in the desert. Sometimes tumbleweeds can drop blue gems. However, I only actually ended up getting one after a whole day of farming. Tragic. Continue your hunt for blue gems today. Tumbleweeds are an option, but they are very inconsistent, as you guys just saw. A better option would be grave digging, or fishing up flotsam with a fishing rod to get a toy boat to trade to that parrot you probably saw near the ocean. Don't know where to find flotsam? Walk around the edge of the map and you are bound to run into some. The same can be said for that parrot, who will be guarding a suspicious looking boat wreck. Summer is fast approaching now, and it's time to actually start preparing. You may have noticed that the non-gold rocks drop a peculiar resource, Niter. We will want as much of this as possible, so if you can, mine up as many of these non-gold rocks as you can. I have no clue what I was doing today. You, however, should focus on what you have already been doing. Get some more Niter and blue gems. And go ahead and start gathering some silk if you already have enough niter and the nine blue gems. So today I made a mistake, and I'll show you what that mistake was here. So, dedicate today to silk harvesting, and what you are watching now is exactly why you should always use traps and never, ever hit a spider with your weapon. One spider hit will aggro every spider within a 15 city block radius. These guys have a very tight knit community and a very effective neighborhood watch it seems. Unfortunately, there was nothing I could do to save Chester. 
Luckily, he will respawn if he dies, so don't worry too much about it. In my attempt to save him, though, I only managed to anger more spiders. The only thing that actually saved me was the patent-pending campfire circle tactic that I used earlier. And even that couldn't handle the wrath of the dreaded stunlock. Saved by the daylight, I retreated and healed. You, however, should hopefully have been smarter than me and not had to deal with that. Due to my setback, I had to spend a majority of today farming silk. We are going for around a stack of silk. You probably won't need the whole stack, but silk is so useful that it's really not bad to over collect it. You should hopefully have enough silk by now. Now it's time to get wood. If Glomer is still alive, unfortunately you may have to say goodbye to him and hello to an old bell. However, if you are feeling attached to the cute little buggy boy, then you can easily just spend today chopping wood by hand. You should still get enough. Today is finally the day. We are going to construct our summer base. This will probably be the most expensive base we have created so far, but it will be worth it. So here are the structures you will need to create. An endothermic fire pit, which requires a whopping four cut stone, or six if you count the two you need for the electrical doodads, and a few niter. An ice box, a siesta lean-to, which is the daytime version of the tent, and requires boards, silk, and rope. A regular fire pit, also, if you are wise, I am not, then build a lightning rod. And then the two optional buildings are a regular tent and a crockpot. Now I know what you may be thinking. Crockpot? Optional? That is correct. Your meaty ball diet is going to be flipped completely upside down this summer, as we are going to live on cactus and their flowers. It's very strangely one of the healthiest diets in this game, as cooked cactus restores almost an equivalent amount of each stat, meaning you will be full on almost everything throughout the summer. You may also be wondering where this base is going to be located. Well, it's going to be located in the desert. It seems counterintuitive, but the desert is actually one of the best places to plop down your base for the summer. Cactuses provide even more food in the form of flowers, like I just went over, and there's not many burnable items, but there will be more about summer in a later segment. You will also want to take your junk football helmets over to your summer base. These can be used to harvest cactuses without losing too much health. Now, I'm going to do something that I have not done before, but in reality there are no more pressing matters. That's right, I'm giving you the next five days to do whatever you want. I will however give you a checklist. In these next five days, you are going to want to move everything essential to your summer base including resources to make hound tooth traps. With that said, you'll also want to learn how to make hound tooth traps in the alchemy engine. Make a fishing rod. Find Chester if you have not yet, that's a pretty important one. Find the parrot if you have not yet. Collect nine blue gems and spend as much time in your summer base as possible. So flowers can spawn, which will in turn spawn butterflies. You guys can see already why that would be a great idea. Are you ready? Go. It's day 56 now. Hopefully you have completed most, if not all of that list. Don't worry if you could not get all nine blue gems. The reason I had you make a fishing rod was so that we could continue fishing up flotsam from the ocean in an attempt to catch that elusive toy boat. Now, things are going to get significantly more challenging this season. So let's go over the effects that summer has on the environment and your character. Temperatures rise significantly. This is the exact opposite of winter. Instead of freezing, you must now combat overheating. Now technically, overheating is slightly easier to beat than freezing, since for a majority of summers, standing under a tree will be enough to not lose health. And any wetness at all will prevent overheating completely. However, it's some of the other features that make summer the hardest season in all of Reign of Giants. And maybe, even all of Don't Starve. Flammable objects spontaneously combust. Yes, you heard that right. 
any flammable item or entity besides the player character can begin smoldering and then combust into flames. This is by far the biggest danger of summer, as fires also spread much more uncontrollably. This can only be combated by spending the summer in the caves or during rain. Red Hounds will spawn. These spread flames upon death. While they are weaker than normal hounds, they present more danger than their blue cousins, because fire can spread and overheat you. Plants will wither in the heat. Much like winter, plants cannot grow during summer. However, not only will plants not grow properly, they also will ungrow. That's right, so fully grown plants will wilt and become unharvestable unless they are fertilized. Cactus plants will flower during the summer. This means whenever you harvest cactus plants, not only will you get that amazing flesh, you will also get a cactus flower, a very powerful healing food item. Food spoils 25% faster due to the heat. There is no combating this feature, just add it to the list on why summer sucks. For some reason, nights are actually longer than they are during autumn. This is probably because in the base game, autumn and winter are the only two seasons. Dusk, however, is the shortest it will ever be, lasting quite literally one clock segment near the solstice. This is probably the only good effect summer has, because it means sanity should not be an issue. Rain is very, very infrequent, but can occur. If it does, utilize it as much as possible, since it will prevent overheating and spontaneous combustion. The boss of this season is Dragonfly. And guess what? If all of these other effects did not convince you that this is the hardest season, Dragonfly is probably the hardest boss in the entire game. Not counting DLC, of course. There are some particularly nasty Hamlet bosses, but we'll get to those guys much later. There will also be more about Dragonfly and her dedicated segment of this video. With all that said, let's get into the cosmetic effects this season has. These effects have little or no gameplay effects. The screen gets a very sepia tone tint to it. Pollen and miscellaneous floaty bits will move around the screen. All sounds will sound distant. It's a very hard phenomenon to describe, let's just say Clay nailed the ambience effect of summer. Everything sounds and looks hot. Now that the list is done, let's get into the gameplay. Here's where I will give you a warning. This segment may be shorter than all of the other seasons simply because summer is such a hostile season that it makes everything almost impossible without Snowchester. I do happen to get Snowchester during this summer, but I consider myself very lucky, so I tried my best to simulate not having him. If you manage to get Snowchester in your playthrough, I will go over in detail what you should be doing instead of me when I get to that part of the video. Otherwise, feel free to follow along. Summer is here, and we are living in our cozy summer desert oasis. Well, it's not really a desert oasis, that's exclusive to Don't Starve Together. But you are a gamer legend who isn't afraid of starving alone, so that's why you are here. Anyways, spend today organizing. What I like to do is keep all flammable items that are important in Chester, like boards and rope. Everything else can be spaced apart. If something starts to smolder, you should be able to extinguish it before it combusts. This, however, is tricky on console. The crockpot actually cannot be extinguished if you are playing on a controller at all. It's very weird, but if your crockpot starts smoldering, then all you can do is say goodbye. This is another reason why it was an optional building to bring along with you. If you are playing as Wilson or Weber, make sure that you have your razor handy. You're going to want to try to stay as cleanly shaven as possible, because beards equal heat, so. If you have your fishing rod, flotsam will be common, especially if you base near the edge like me. While fishing, I actually managed to get the toy boat, which allowed me to get enough gems to make snow chester. When, or if, you get all nine blue gems, arrange them like this, and before you know it, chester will begin levitating, and then fall down as snow chester. Snow Chester is not the only choice you have for upgrading. There is also Shadow Chester, which has three extra inventory slots and uses Nightmare Fuel instead of Blue Gems. However, Snow Chester is superior and I will go over why tomorrow. While you watch me farm Tumbleweeds, I will explain what you should do with your new powerful pet. Now, 
Before we start, you must protect Snowchester with your life. He will still respawn if he dies, but he will respawn as normal boring Chester, meaning you will have to collect all nine blue gems again. This won't be too hard since Chester has a particularly massive health pool and regen speed. If, and again, if you have Snow Chester by now, I highly suggest you spend the summer one of two ways, either exploring the surface world if you haven't fully explored it, or caving. Snow Chester acts like an ice box, meaning any thermal stones you put in him will become ice cold. If you make two thermal stones and juggle them, you are essentially immune to overheating. Be aware that all the other downsides of summer are still in effect. However, if you decide to go into the caves, then most things are actually pretty good. I, however, am going to pretend I don't have Snow Chester, so I won't go caving or do too much exploring. And if you want to go caving, do not worry, because while I haven't covered caving quite yet, I promise the caving slash ruin segment is coming very soon. If you are not fortunate and do not have Snow Chester quite yet, then most of your summer will be spent doing this. Yes, chasing tumbleweeds while taking occasional breaks to cool down your thermal stone. If you thought winter was boring, oh boy are you in for a treat. Today you are going to set up your hound tooth trap field. This is to allow you to handle the coming hound attacks with little to no damage. Hopefully you learned this recipe last season because if not, it requires an alchemy engine. Take your rope, logs, and hound teeth with you to an area in between your summer base and your main base. Then, place your teeth trap in a straight line like this. Whenever hounds attack, you can simply run up and down this line until they have all been defeated. Remember after each attack to reset the traps as well. Remember when I said this segment was going to be shorter than most segments? Yeah, summer is boring and I'm going to be honest, the real goal of summer in this game is to skip it altogether. So my friend, repeat what you've been doing for the next 10 days. That's right, 10 whole days without guidance. I'm not totally evil though, so I will give you a list of things to do. Make sure to utilize your siesta lean-to. This helps skip the hot days and then you can either wait out the short nights or use your tent. Be aware that the tent will heat you up whereas the siesta lean-to cools you down. Be on the lookout for smoldering items in your camp. Make sure to extinguish them if possible before they burst into flames. If you get hungry, grab a nearly broken football helmet and get to cactus picking. This should allow you to get through summer with ease hunger-wise. Remember to head up to your tooth trap field during hound attacks. And finally, harvest as many tumbleweeds as possible. These guys are essentially loot crates that can drop almost every item and blueprint in the game. With all that said, let's start your countdown. It is now day 70. Congrats to you for making it this far. You officially have three days left until you transition into your second year. Unfortunately, your transition may not be as peaceful as the last 10 days you just experienced. Dragonfly has the chance to descend upon your base at any moment now. This will be the hardest fight you have had to go through throughout your entire playthrough, but luckily you have me here to guide you through it. Now, there are two ways to deal with the beast herself. Fight and flee. Personally, I choose the latter almost every time. I just can't justify a fight for the mediocre drops that she gives. I even shamefully ran away from her in my 100 days Reign of Giants challenge. If you really, really need a fireproof chest or chest plate that sets enemies on fire for some reason, then you must fight her. Unfortunately, unlike all of the other giants, Dragonfly is unkiteable. Not only does she have a flaming aura causing damage to every entity around her, she also has mastered the art of attacking while moving. This not only makes her unkiteable, but it also makes it almost impossible to run away from her when she's mad at you unless you have some sort of speed boost. So how do we take down this beast? There's two options you have that won't cost you tons of gunpowder. Using a log suit and a football helmet, and utilizing swapping to your walking cane after hitting and being on a road, you can theoretically kite her with a two hit pattern. This won't result in no damage being taken, however. The flaming aura will still burn you, 
but the damage will be somewhat minimal. It will take 41 hits with your Dark Sword to take her down. Another, far safer option is to head to a rocky field and look for two boulders that are very close together. Enough that the player can fit through, but Dragonfly cannot. Don't have any rocks like this? Then don't worry, because you can also use fire pits. With Dragonfly wedged, you can actually relatively safely kite her with a 1 to 2 hit kiting pattern. You will still take burn damage, but you shouldn't get slashed up as bad as you would normally. You may also notice there's no footage of me fighting her. Yeah, this game hates me and decided not to spawn a single giant all year. And while I'm really not sure why, when I decide to cover Shipwrecked, I will be putting Seal Nato on Moor instead of Standard. So I can at least show off that battle, since setting a giant to Moor pretty much guarantees a spawn. I, I really just don't know why none of them decided to spawn. Anyways, what about the other option? Fleeing. This option is very easy, and one that I actually highly suggest if you, like me, don't care for a fireproof chest or a useless chess piece. It will consist of you leaving your base during the Dragonfly warning period, and then once she spawns, simply go through a wormhole or run far enough away. Dragonfly will actually despawn if you do this correctly, nullifying this terrifying beast. Keep an ear out for Dragonfly arriving, but other than that, there's nothing special to do today. Enjoy your last day of summer. If Dragonfly hasn't attacked yet, she is very unlikely to attack now. The heat should also now be receding enough that you can safely walk around without a thermal stone. However, you will need to occasionally seek the shade of a tree to cool off. And with that, welcome back to Autumn. You, my friend, have survived an entire year of Don't Starve Reign of Giants. After your first year, you should have everything covered, and survival from here on out should be far, far easier. If you manage to survive a full year using the survival guide, leave a comment describing what the most helpful tip I provided was. However, that's not the end of this video. And whether you skipped this brand new segment, or you watched through the entire year, welcome to the fifth and final segment of my comprehensive Don't Starve Reign of Giants survival guide. In this segment, I will be teaching you how to survive the caves, and the ruins. Let's start with everything you should get before entering the caves, and how exactly you enter the caves in the first place. Here's what you will need. A miner's hat. This will really help. Not only do they last much longer than a torch, they are also refuelable using light bulb plants that you will find in the cave. Snowchester is incredibly helpful. While not as essential as the miner's hat, Snowchester will keep your food cold for you while you are down there. Speaking of food, you will want to bring a sizable amount of food. Meatballs are a great option. Food is hard to get down in the caves. A decent weapon, or even two. Shadow swords are the best option, but spears will work just as well. A football helmet and a log suit. For normal fights, wear the log suit. For fights where you are already around a light source, feel free to add that football helmet in too. A pickaxe. This goes without saying, but almost every resource in the caves requires a pickaxe. With that list done, how do you even enter the caves? Somewhere on your journey, you should have come across a plugged sinkhole. Simply mine this up and jump in. Now, unlike my other segments, this won't be based on days. I'm just going to go over the basics and what to expect in these challenging regions. First, let's start with the cave's effects and what they mean for the player. Permanent darkness. There are still some spots that allow daylight to break through into the darkness, but other than those spots, it is permanently dark, leading to consistent sanity loss and Charlie danger. Hound attacks are replaced by depth worms attacks. These strange angler worms are actually easier to fend off than hounds because they attack in a much lower number. They do, however, pack a mean punch so avoid being hit by them. Instead of a day-night cycle, you will have what's called a nightmare cycle. This is only mildly noticeable in the caves and will be covered in more detail when we get to the ruins. Only one season has an effect on the caves in a noticeable way. Spring. If you decide to go caving during the spring, it will be consistently raining due to puddles on the surface, 
leading to further sanity loss unless you can achieve 100% wetness resistance. The caves actually provide some temperature protection and protect from seasonal temperature world effects, such as spontaneous combustion in the summer. You will, however, not be fully protected from temperature. Earthquakes can happen. These are not too dangerous, but the falling items can injure the player, though it's generally easy to dodge falling items since they produce a shadow. Other than that, the caves are pretty tame. Let's, however, go through the unique enemies you may encounter down here. Rock Lobsters. These will be your best friend down in the caves. They can be temporary allies by feeding them flint or rocks. They can devastate just about any enemy down here for you. Cave Spiders. These variants are significantly more dangerous than their surface-bound cousins, with one labeled the Spitter, who has a ranged attack, and one who is armored and takes less damage. They, however, much like their cousins, are weak to traps, so just trap them. Battalisks. These guys suck. They will circle just out of your range and then attack at random times. Try to stay away from them if you can and if you care about your personal sanity. Bunny men. These are the bunny version of the pigmen. And let's just say they are her radical vegans. They are normally neutral and can even be recruited by feeding them carrots, much like pigmen. However, if you are holding any meat items in your inventory, they will attack you with the force of a thousand angry vegans. Depth Worm. These guys are the hounds of the underground. They hit hard, but move very slow. They will attempt to lure you in by showing their shiny glow berry to you. Slurtles. These guys are strange and I barely ever see them, so I can't give many tips on them that I can confidently say are true. If you have experience with these guys, feel free to comment down below to help others out. And last but not least, Big Tentacle. Just don't hit this guy. It's not worth it. You don't even want to know what happens. With the enemies done, let's go over the special biomes that are down here. Mushroom Biome. One of, if not the most useful biome down here. Many, and I mean many types of mushrooms will spawn down here. Not only do the mush trees provide light, some are also green caps, which as you should know by now is one of the best sanity management items. The Swamp. This biome is treacherous. You will encounter many tier 3 spider nests and maybe even a spider queen. The only benefit is all the fighting occasionally yields a tentacle spike. A direct upgrade to the spear, however, a downgrade to your dark sword. The Rocky Biome. This is where boulders will spawn. This also is home to our best friends, the Rock Lobsters. The Guano Biome. It's as gross as it sounds. Stalagmites are common here, as well as the dreaded Battalisk. And finally, the Cave Spider Biome. Here is not only where you will find those cave spiders that we previously mentioned, but also going through here you may notice a strange pile of orange rocks. This is the entrance to the ruins. Before you dive down into the ruins, recruit some rock lobster friends. They will help you immensely down there. Welcome to the deepest part of Don't Starve, the ruins. Down here you will find many useful items. Let's however go over the ruins effects and what they mean for you as the player. There is total darkness. Unlike the caves, there is no connection to the surface. The only source of constant light is light bulb plants and slurpers. The nightmare cycle is in full effect. Occasionally the ruins will light up an ominous red color. This will allow shadow monsters to spawn no matter what your sanity level is. I don't think I need to describe how dangerous this can be. All of the cave effects that were previously mentioned are active here as well. Now that that's over with, let's go over the new unique enemies you will face down here. Slurpers. These hairy balls of strangeness are hostile, and best ignored. They drop pelt which can be used in combination with Verger's drop to make a belt of hunger. An honestly pretty useless item. Broken chess pieces. These are pretty much identical to their surface world cousins, however they are significantly more common. Splamunkies. Just stay away from these guys or exterminate them. They are the worst thing to ever exist in this game, capable of barraging you with poop and lowering your sanity to zero in mere seconds. Cave Dwellers. These albino spiders are just upgraded spider warriors, capable of lunging at the player. Their only unique feature is that their spawn point is indestructible. They, much like their cousins, are susceptible to traps. 
And finally, the Ancient Guardian. The boss of the ruins. And don't worry guys, unlike the other bosses, you will actually get to see me fight this beast in this one. Now, let's go over the unique biomes of the ruins. The Lichen Biome. Here, Cave Lichen will spawn, a decent food source. You can also fish up cave eels from the ponds in this biome. The Chess Piece Biome. This biome holds an important workstation, the Ancient Pseudoscience Station. Repairing this allows you to make all of the endgame items you could ever dream of. It also is home to an insane amount of chess piece creatures and gem statues. The Splamonkey Biome. Stay far away from here. Sure, there's cave bananas which are a decent food source, but the residents here are incredibly hostile. And finally, the maze. This biome is home to the albino cave dwellers and the ancient guardian. How do we fight this beast? The easiest way is to simply use that rock lobster army that you brought down. Hit the guardian once and then sit back and watch as you get this boss killed for you. You will also be rewarded with a random amount of loot and the guardian's horn, which can make the ultra powerful Houndius Shootius, which as its name implies is excellent for hound defense. With all of that done, you should now be more than confident to head into the depths of Don't Starve Reign of Giants. And I am more than confident to consider this tutorial complete. I really hope that it helped some of you survive your first year and make the most of it in this amazing DLC. I have a few more Don't Starve related projects coming soon. All of which focus on the single player game, something that is criminally underrated. Sure, Don't Starve Together is fun, but sometimes you just gotta enjoy Clay's masterpiece, that is the OG Don't Starve. Don't forget to leave a like, comment down below, and subscribe if you are not. It really does help the channel, and this video especially took a massive amount of time to complete. Don't know what to comment about? Just say something random. It's a fact that YouTube treats comments as good engagement, and every comment you guys leave down below helps get this Reign of Giant tutorial in front of more people. With all of that said, this has been Polar Lotus, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.